This is the Monocast, all about open source marketing automation with Montic. And here is your host, Hecky Gamble. Now, welcome to number 36 of the Morticast. Hello, yeah. Leon. Good Has to see you. Hello there. It's been a while, I see. Is it? 36 uh, episodes. Oh, oh yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody out there. We are recording this on October, no, August, August. 1st, <laughs> yeah. which um, is co coincidentally release date for Mordic 4.4.1. Yeah. We're going to refer to that in a second. Uh, a bit later in this episode, we will come to our interview of the week or whatever month. Episode. Of the episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, um, and this time, we went back to Mordic conference global where, where there were multiple talks on email deliverability and email inboxing yep. in this case i asked jana tori aspraki to um do a second round with me because yep. uh, nice. at, the, at the time i was the host for that uh, okay. talk <laughs> coincidentally yeah. <laughs> and so we said we would not repeat the entire talk we would just do a a follow-up thing a q and a thing where i um, we would uh talk about additional questions for that talk may, maybe deeper or or wider or whatever um to make this even more complete so th that's certainly really valuable stuff for everybody who is into email deliverability mm -hmm. um yeah but let's start with some housekeeping yeah we got some housekeeping left to do from the last episode i think we talked about the new media manager that there's a PR for that. And in the meantime, we found out that this PR or this uh, update would be for the old yeah. builder, which is kind of a, yeah, I'd not to say bummer, but uh, <laughs> would yeah. be nicer to have it for the Grapes JS. Yeah, that, that is also in the working, but, yeah. but Joey kindly reminded me yeah. that <laughs> this one is not, not only not merged, but it's also not for Grapes JS. <laughs> yeah. so, okay, there you go. Unlucky, yeah. I think that's that's it for the housekeeping. Yeah, we did mention some things with 4.4, some annoyances like uh, cannot create a numeric custom field and oh, stuff yeah. like that. We yeah. had a workaround for that. Uh, as of today, 4.4.1 has been released. <laughs> that bug is covered. Mm -hmm. nice. uh, like other ones, so there was a nasty one that came up for people who used Composer for updating. Mm -hmm. And that process would, uh, well make the configuration disappear. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> technically speaking, the local uh, PHP uh, <laughs> was deleted and yeah. the, that uh, deletes your settings. And uh, you th that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, well, nothing cannot be recovered. Yeah. We all do our backups, don't we? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but of course, nasty. Um, yeah. So that's out of the world now. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of other things had have been improved with 4.4.1 a lot of sooner or, or older or younger bugs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, some may familiar may sound familiar to some not we will link to the show uh, to, to the release notes and there's certainly something in it for you one thing that i find um, noteworthy is that finally the the user language preferences are honored over the system language yeah, preferences. Finally, yeah. Yeah. Some performance improvements too. So a lot of good stuff like like a minor release should should bring. Yeah. Yeah. Also one 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 follow up maybe that we did not mention in the last episode was that there's a new button in, in the right, marketplace. Yeah, that uh, the marketplace uh, clear cache button. Yeah. Just, so, uh, like everybody else you wondered wow well, what what mm. Yeah, what, what does, does it, it do really it? mean? <laughs> is it misleading? Is it not? Um, it is. Turns out it is, yeah. So th this thing is just refreshing the marketplace view. It's not clearing the, the entire the cache. cache. Yeah. So, yeah. But but it's a, a beta, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, anything else for 4.4, 4.41 core stuff? No, not yet. I think we, we covered everything that is of importance. Okay, then let's move on to third party code yeah and maybe we can start with um, a i think a, one, one of the 
<laughs> important <laughs> things is obviously email. We did talk about yeah, that quite a lot, uh, yeah. quite a bit in the last episode. <laughs> it's our main topic for this episode. Here we have a piece of code that is about bounce handling. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it reads, mark emails as failed if they fail. Do not set them as do not contact. Oh, yeah. Yes. So we have a given uh, behavior in Mautic, uh, which is pretty s drastic. So whenever something goes wrong, this email goes to do not contact, right, yeah. DNC. And this uh, PR, uh, th so this code suggestion, changes that behavior. No, oh, that's pretty handy, actually. Yeah, uh, also it's, it's really important and it's not a no-brainer because there are certain, certain different opinions on what is the best behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so I suggest everybody who has an opinion on that should go to that, well, to the PR or to the forum thread that we also, also link to. And first of all, comment on, on the sensibility. Is this really the best behavior? Yeah. And if it's close to sensible <laughs> or if nothing else then then you should also go there and test it because we want it to be thoroughly tested when it goes to to the main mainstream code yeah surely and yeah um there are other ends in in terms of bounce handling etc uh, bounce handling handling, handling. etc <laughs> um so the discussion is not yet over but but i'm very happy to see some movement here yeah and um Talking about uh, third-party code, I think there was an, yeah, uh, a plugin or, or a bundle, I'd say, by, by Matthias Sexmeister about a uh, Slack notification on an outdated Mordic version. Um, yeah, this is about monitoring the Mordic version, right, yeah. basically your own Mordic, uh, Mordic version. Not a new topic. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had a long-standing pull request that displays a flash message in, inside of your Mordic if your Mordic version needs an update. Yeah, true, yeah. This approach, approach by Matisse uh, Sackmeister is external, so so it notifies you via Slack. No, oh, nice. That means you can also get uh, notifications from um, instances that you do not log into. Mm -hmm. So that may be handy for people who run more than their own. Mordic yeah. or Mord Mordicis. <laughs> um, it's certainly helpful, or I'm sure it's helpful for his personal um, demands. Uh, um, each time I talk to, to people about this, everybody has their own ideas, everybody has their own <sighs> little tools in, in the drawer um, or, or in, in, in practice. Yeah. So it's it's something for those who run multiple instances. It's something for the more service providers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I have to admit we have our own thing that or things that we do. Some yeah. some of our N nifty toolbox for yeah, monitoring. So some are manual. <laughs> some some are semi manual. Yeah. Some some are indeed uh, API based, but it's it's not at the core of Mautic to me. I mean, we, we have a limited uh, amount of development capacity. Yeah, we do. And I, I do think that should all go into making Mordic uh, the great thing that we can make it. Mm -hmm. uh, while for those who earn money with, with running Mordic instances, that should come from them, from us, whatever, not from the core project. True, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of other things you could say, think of. Uh, as, as a comparison, we do similar things in the two, Type of 3 world. There mm -hmm. is an external plugin called Type of 3 Monitor. Yeah, yeah. And it does a ton of valuable things. It can filter you by all things. It, it also covers uh, plugin versions, etc. It can also run other things like, hey, show me legacy user accounts, weak passwords, whatever. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it would be and, lovely um, to have for Mordic as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, and once you get started with ideas like that, yeah. you, you come to pretty complex things. So going going one thing, uh, one step by another is good. And here's another step. So thumbs up, Matisse. Okay, next up is Twilio. Twilio has been around as a core feature for a long time. For a long time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
very helpful thing, uh, but ha I think also it has not really changed over a long time. Not really. No. And here's an in initiative by a guy called Corey Worrell mm -hmm. from EMRL in Sacramento. Ooh, I haven't heard of them yet, I no. gotta say. No, nor have I. Uh, so, yeah, may maybe it's, it's our ignorance, but, but welcome, good to see you, Corey. <laughs> and what, what, what he did... Um, Uh, is basically add some additional features to the Twilio plugin mm -hmm. by by adding or by providing another plugin that people can install. Ah. And uh, once you do that, you have the things like like additional stop words. Mm -hmm. In 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 Mautic, people type stop to unsubscribe for, from SMS <laughs> feed. Simple. In, in, yeah, and, and fair enough, but, but in Twilio there are alternatives to that, so mm -hmm. Twilio can listen to unsubscribe or to cancel, or things like that. Yeah. And now Morty can, can do that too. No, nice, yeah. Or you can add a static uh, auto reply. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. thanks thanks for your message, but we're not monitor monitoring this or whatever you like. Yeah. Static, really. Um, Yeah, and those things are now available in Mordic, so yeah. thanks to EMRL. Yeah, and um, when we're talking about Twilio, I think WhatsApp ain't that far. And um, currently Joey is working on his uh, so-called weekend project, and he's <laughs> trying to, to build the Mordic WhatsApp plugin, um, but he's kind of looking for help because he's yeah stuck on some ends and uh, needs man or woman power left and right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um... WhatsApp integration has been possible through Twilio with some webhook magic, mm -hmm. etc. So it's not not oh, right. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Joey took the approach to say, okay, don't I don't want this complicated things. I want a simple plugin. Yeah. And uh, he found a different service called Vova. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome name, <laughs> isn't it? Um, which gives him fairly simple and fairly affordable WhatsApp integration with, with Mordic. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, Joe is not a coder. He's, he's a fantastic guy. He does some coding, but he's not, not a uh, oh, seven days a week coder. Yeah. So he's helping us so much. Why, why not help him? <laughs> If you have For once. any interest in, in, in helping Joey and or making a great WhatsApp plugin for Mordic, then go to the link in the show notes. Oh, what else do we have? Mm, some some best practice questions for you. One is about um, editing emails. In yeah, Talking about emails once again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, but from a different angle. Uh, editing emails in, in Mordic. Yeah. Uh, and basically about the workflow, how people do that. Some, some I would think, use the themes that are provided with Mordic. Mm -hmm. So, Paprika and all and that. And to confirm me and yada, yada. Yep. Yada, yada. <laughs> um, some may come up with their own themes, mm -hmm. um, which is fairly frequent practice in our yeah, world. It is. Um, but in the forums, there was a question that said, well, well I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, hey, uh, the Mordic limit, uh, the, the Mordic editor is a little limited to me, uh, so I want to use an external editor. Which ones are you using? Mm -hmm. And then uh, feedback came like, well, MGMLIO uh, is the best place to go. Yep. Or from TechBill, there came a recommendation for a nice Mac app for MGML. To me, the question is, is that a good practice do, do people really do that uh, do they stumble upon the the, the limited uh what I, i i don't know header features in in modic mgml etc so so the differences between plain mgml and our our flavor yeah um is it not creating incoherent email templates i don't know i mean so This is really a question to you, to, to the listeners out there, if this is a good uh, thing for you, if this is, is a workflow that you live and love, and also what, what tools you may 
uh, use for that. Yeah. And if not, what are your suggestions or what are yeah. the workflows? Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, give us a feedback, please. Yeah, surely. Yeah, talking about feedback. Um, in the forums, there's been a question about is anyone actually using the Mordix built in calendar? And I personally got to admit, I've never really used it or tried to remotely understand what it really does and what it shows. Have you tried to understand mm. what the calendar is <laughs> actually all about? Oh, you're asking me. <laughs> yeah, uh, kind of rhetorical. Let's skip the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the thread, um, there was a really interesting comment by Andy Town, our friend from Everacara, who just suggested to scrape that whole thing as it is at the moment and just a about 10 point list on how we could improve it or what could replace it and it was super interesting to see his insights on how we could change the calendar to something that would be useful at all yeah i i'm kind of relieved that i'm not the only one out there who is <laughs> ignoring the calendar yeah <laughs> uh, yeah and, th and thanks and thumbs up to andy for his construct Activity, is that the word? Feedbackivity, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, maybe one day somebody will bring some love to the calendar and, and rebuild it from scratch looking, or whatever. Yeah. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Good. Then um, let's move on to the interview of the week. I already gave the outlines, I guess. Um, yeah. uh, so it's, it's a little bit special because um, we are referring to a, an existing talk, a Mordicon talk. Mm -hmm. We're not repeating it all, um, but we're enriching it, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, listen to it. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Hello, Yana Tori. Welcome to the show. Uh, and nice to talk to you again after uh, Mordicon Conference Global 2022. Hello, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to further discuss uh, email and deliverability. I am too. And uh, in the preparation for this interview, we agreed that we would not repeat the same thing over again that we already talked about in the, or that you talked about in the conference, but rather do a little uh, enhanced Q&A session. Um, to tell the truth, some of the questions are my, my own ones. Others come from colleagues, but also from from the meetup group here or the forums. So it's a constant topic, this email email inboxing, deliverability thing. So uh, no wonder that, that there are a ton of questions. And, and I would love to go into the, the details a little bit more than we did a couple of months ago. However, if, if you as the listener have not watched that talk, then, then please uh, press the pause button right now and go to YouTube and uh, find the talk, Mordic Conference Email Inboxing. Um, and the majority of the topics here will really refer directly to the talk. So it's a good idea to do watch the talk first and then get back to this beautiful interview. Okay, now for everybody else who's still here, um, I assume that you did watch the talk. If you haven't, Janator, please once again give give us the basics about yourself, what you do, what, who you are, where you are, and all that, and how the cat is doing. Sounds great. So I'm Yana Tori. I'm a deliverability specialist and one of the partners at Email Console. Um, we are a deliverability monitoring tool and we talk about deliverability 24-7. We're trying to make it more accessible to people. Lately, a lot of senders out there have had... Um, have seen more and more of their emails land in the spam filters of their audience members. And uh, panic is either coming or a lot of questions definitely are coming more. Uh, so I'm excited to be here to talk about deliverability with you. That's cool. And uh, the big question, what does it mean? Why should I care about it? It's like everything else answered in the talk. <laughs> Um, of so, course. Um, um, I think the, the reason that you gave is, is the practical example that like, like I'm sending out an email and uh, my open rate is, is taking a dip. Uh, so I agree. It's, it's uh, more and more important these days. Um, I would like to, to take a direct follow up to one of the latest point in, in your talk. I mean, basically, The, the topics that you described there are all the things that can harm your inboxing rate, uh, both on the technical and the content side. 
but also the the ways of understanding and monitoring what is going on. So one thing that you showed but not really explained was the cool uh, the tool a cool tool <laughs> called seed listing. And uh, people asked about that. Can 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 you tell us a little bit more about this seed listing thing? Yes, of course. So oftentimes um, when we see deliverability issues, they can either be with specific mailbox providers or they can be with multiple mailbox providers. The important part of deliverability is that you need to understand that you have a reputation with each single mailbox provider, every block list, every ISP, and you have to maintain all those relationships for emails to continue to land in the inbox. So when we see, when we we sometimes feel that there might be a deliverability problem, emails are not landing in the inbox, they're landing in a spam or nowhere at all, we're not counting here the promotions tabs, that is still the inbox, mm. really the spam folder junk or nowhere at all. What we'd like to do at the beginning to measure where we're having the most issues is a seed listing test. So it's a simple inbox placement test. Um, a tool like an email console, for example, or any other, will give you a list of email addresses, you upload them in your CRM, you send a normal email to them as if they were part of your audience, and we will give you back results. So we will let you know from all the emails that you've sent, which ones we have received in the inbox, in the junk or spam folder, or if we, some inboxes have not received them at all. And from there, we can further analyze multiple things. Mm -hmm. Every email that's sent comes with a lot of information that doesn't even appear um, to the sender. Like usually you see the content, you can click on links and see the images, but an email has more information, just like a picture that has the date and the um, size of the file and all that information. Uh, we don't see it in the picture, but it's still stored inside that file. So the same thing with email. So with a seed listing test, we can see even more information, how you're authenticated, if your email um, is properly set up, if you have all the information you need in order to be sending safe, secure emails. So mm -hmm. it's a great place to start and to see with which mailbox providers you have an issue. Okay, and so, from so there, we can analyze a lot more. Okay, it is, so it is uh, basically doing spam testing and, and analyzing as well. Okay. Exactly. Uh, does it also hook into feedback loop, loop type of things or look at, at bounces or anything? So or? It, yeah. it, what it will look at is from what an audience member would receive. So what we're mm. going to get there is where it's going to inbox and as well what the um, different spam filters are going to think of it. So mm. for example, the Yahoo ones are not going to read the header the same way as the Gmail, the, um, like the Google inboxes, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. And... Um, If we will monitor, for example, uh, if a domain and the sender IP at that moment is on a block list. Yeah. So that is definitely important because it will, of, of course, affect the inbox placement. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, now, those mailbox providers that you just mentioned, um, they, they may look at block lists, those public block lists, but they also yeah. do their own monitoring which you describe in depth based on all sort of things ratios and, and engagement etc and that turns into i don't know domain reputation ip reputation mm -hmm. even internal internal block list um and i've seen some where you can even ask for a delisting if something went bad and that you want to improve so you can delist directly with the mailbox providers um yes is that First of all, am I getting that right? Is it a fair statement, or would you describe yes, it? Yes, it is. the The biggest issue with getting delisted is usually uh, the sender doesn't want to change something that is being perceived as bad, mm. or cannot explain it correctly enough. Mm. And the thing that we kind of forget is that these, you know, there's not like a, a million people. Uh, you know, taking care of the postmaster support, mm. right? Mm -hmm. For Google and Hotmail. And you can imagine all the local providers, you have the GMX, La Poste, Orange, they're not the same size as Google now, right? So the we're fighting with machines and just a handful of people that are able to take these support tickets, analyze them, and then assess risk. Uh, so yelling at them or send, well, you cannot really yell at them. Sending them very angry messages is not going to get you delisted. Uh, what's going to get you delisted is changing the behavior that got you listed. 
Mm. Getting delisted after that is very simple. You explain you, you're polite. Hello, uh, hello Google, Hotmail, whoever it is. Um, we fi- we saw this issue when we got listed. We fixed it by doing this, this, and that. We are going to protect ourselves by doing this and that in the future. Is everything? Is anything else that am I missing? Um, can you please delist? Yeah. Most yeah. of the times you don't even need to answer back after 24 or 48 hours, they delist you or they will reply back and say, hey, you missed this, which sometimes you cannot figure out because there's so many problems. You fix certain of them and some of them might have been hidden behind another problem. And just this normal conversation. And, th- and that's it. Um, we're dealing with machines here. It's not a person Tinder swiping your emails in the inbox or the spam folder. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a machine. So um, different red flags that like in a very generic perspective might look okay doesn't look okay for like a mailbox provider like for a machine Mm. so simple things can be the number of email the number of emails that you send to if they're constantly changing and the message is always the same the chances are that either you're in a business in an industry where the sales cycle is short or you're buying a list so it's for machine is like you know ones and zeros and all of them together is going to wait yes or no do we trust the email to come in or out mm-hmm. so the deleasing part is making sure you reduce the red flags and you politely ask if there's anything else you must fix because a lot of times a lot of people don't realize that they're not even the problem forms being abused um, the double opt-in not cleaning out enough of the bad emails uh, people didn't know about this cleaning these things accumulate over time and the machine just has two way too many red flags Mm. um so sometimes it's not something crazy most of the times it's a simple issue and if you fix it you're going to get delisted and very very quickly because the machine will see the difference yeah well what i find difficult really is to deal with that in in different regions because you have so many local providers as i just said yes and they all have their own ways um and I would love to have some some sort of comprehensive overview of of those mailbox providers, what to watch out for, how to detect issues in the first place. Like like uh, in this case, uh, for this, you really should closely uh, watch closely the, the soft bounces. For others, look at that or yeah. whatever. And then may, maybe even policies or or link to a form, etc. Is, is there any such website that that gives a good overview of of the top fifty mailbox providers? No. No, there isn't. I, I, you know what? We should probably sit down and write one. Yeah, we're thinking the same. Right? Maybe that's the next thing we should do. Yeah. Um, the 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 one thing that I think all fellow deliverability specialists are going to agree on, and I hope they do. Mm. Um, if not, as for myself, is that one, one thing? A trend that I'm seeing personally is that everyone is going towards the. Consumer first. So what does the person receiving the email want and what do we need to protect that person from? Mm -hmm. And no matter how everyone is doing it a little bit differently, at the end of the day, that's the most important part. Google doesn't care about my business and my email console emails. What they care about is my subscribers and the people who are using Google. Those are the people that Google is trying to keep happy, right? The Gmail users and the G Suite users. And what that means at the end of the day is that the mailbox providers are going to look for senders and accept the emails of senders who engage with their users and their users engage with them. Uh, a user that they can clearly see there's some sort of relationship with. They want to see positive human action and no matter what strategy marketers and affiliate marketers and really good strategies put together, if they start annoying the Google users and the Hotmail users and things like that, they're just going to build spam filters that detect that behavior. Mm. So the more strategies we create, the easier it is for spam filters to detect it and to analyze it. And no matter how random we try to be, even randomization, there's patterns in it. Yeah. So the most important part is getting that user to engage. It's not anymore writing that one email that fits for everyone that we send once a week and everyone gets us a message. It's It's been too long that that's not okay and mm. people are still doing it. And that's going to be the biggest, biggest thing, engagement. Think of it like social media. 
Mm. We don't care, you know, we might care about the followers, but we need those constant likes over time. We need those constant conversions. Any mm. email is a tool to convert. Yeah, it depends. I mean, when you talked about uh, engagement being more and more important in the talk, yeah. uh, then I really, A, one thing, I, uh, I really thought uh, does not really apply to everyone or it's not uh, easy for everyone. So, uh, repeat yes, exactly. I can imagine a lawyer from, yeah. is not as you know sexy to sell as I don't know a new yeah. pair of shoes or a car or something, right? Also, the, the return uh, business types are different from. I think you you gave the the example of a mattress being sold, not every, yes, every exactly. Month. Um, but I was still thinking, okay, I, I get the point now. How can I? rephrase my emails or re reconstruct or redesign my campaigns to encourage a second opening or a, a reply for instance is this are things should i work more intensively with with replying to emails is this important feature for modic for instance um ah, okay or is it um, a rephrase so should i just uh, act naturally and not try to game the system Yes, exactly. So th that's the um, the important part here is just like we have with social media, different industries, different types of content and patterns are going to be enforced in one way or another differently. So somebody who might be in a more difficult industry might have different issues than somebody who's selling shoes. So we're thinking, you know, cryptocurrency emails from legitimate places mm -hmm. versus people who sell so shoes or stress about different things, right? Yeah. Um, But each one has their own kind of engagement patterns. Google will understand that these kinds of customers expect this kind of engagement from them and this kind of business, we're going to expect different kind of engagement from them. The issue at the end of the day, though, remains the percentage of positive engagement we have with brands versus negative and what makes sense in your industry and the way you send because some cryptocurrency companies send emails 20 times a day and some of them send you one weekly email even those need to be compared differently so all of these semantics are going to be for the big businesses you know the googles mm. and the hotmails and things like that what about the smaller yeah. um esps so what they're going to look at again is the green versus the red flags people who have emails that are being engaged with in normal ratios that people are going to reply or read when they're like at normal intervals is always going to inbox better than a business that sends an email whenever it remembers to send an email. People forget about the brand. Things are inconsistent. The open rates kind of go up and down. Uh, the Things bounce because there's so much time between emails. There's so much difference there, mm. but still it's easy to calculate the red flags versus the green flags. Okay. And All the right. mailbox providers at the end of the day, that's what they want. Happy people. Mm. So from a company like Google that is maybe has a more sophisticated way to track engagement versus a smaller, very local, you know, Greek inbox provider that is looking for it, what they want is the same at the end of the day. People yeah. that are happy in their inbox. Okay. Okay. I guess I, I get that. Um, and I, it's understandable too. Okay. Um, let's switch topic entirely and go, go to some, some technical Th things um, sure. this one is about um, uh, setting up new infrastructure so uh, infrastructure like like new IP address etc one yes. common term there is you have to warm up the, the service the IPs with the mailbox providers um, yes so, so how does it what does it really mean uh, how, is this a manual process are there tools how, how, how does this go oh ah, okay so it The, the warm-up process, the reason we, we do this is because we don't want to shock um, spam filters. So it makes sense that one of the things that can be a very big red flag is if a domain was purchased you know, yesterday and today it starts sending 10 million emails. In, in what world did I get 10 million signups in 24 hours to a business that existed since yesterday, right? So it's, an, it's, of course, a huge red flag. And in order to protect users, 
uh, they're going to say, you know what, we're going to block all the emails and we're going to let some in in order to establish are these good senders or not? Are people complaining, happy, not happy? And then slowly put it, let more emails go in. So instead of doing it that way, where you're shocking a machine, in the warm-up period, you're doing the other way around. You buy an IP, you buy your domains, and then you, when everything is set up and ready to send, you start sending a little bit of email. So say, hello, I exist, I have some customers, I'm sending emails, look, everybody's happy, my open rates are normal, uh, my bounces are also normal in the thresholds. People are engaging, they're not complaining about it. And as you continue, you just start sending more or you start introducing new pieces of your infrastructure. Mm. It's just plainly put to not shock machines on the other end. Okay. Is it about Now, domains or IPs? Uh, domains and IPs. Mm. Yeah, so domains and IPs, even people who have domains that they've used for years, if they move from one provider to another provider, it, it can be shocking. Like, hey, this company has been using, I don't know, cake mail for 15 years, and now suddenly they're using MailChimp. Like, they would protect the, the, the audience member just in case it's a spoofing or there's, a, there's an issue. It's normal that we have to reintroduce ourselves and make sure that any change that we make is going to be kind of slowly enforced in the spam filters. Mm. And warm-up is not only for new domains and new IPs, it can also be used for a huge pivot of your company. You know, if you go from being a high fashion company to a non-profit, you're going, you're going to have to reintroduce yourself to the spam filters. Mm. Or, you know, if you were a, a store and now have a new pharmaceutical department, but never talked about pharmaceuticals before, maybe slowly adding the content in would be more, uh, would be more beneficial than just like Mac, let's go, let's talk about, you know, medicine and insurance and things like that. Yeah. In uh, so warm up is for everything. Yeah. In general, okay, okay. So, sorry. Thank, thanks for that. And I think that the broader sense of warming up, uh, it's good to keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, yes. Now, sometimes there's a, what is the term, send, send rate or something. There, there are mailbox providers who say, okay, I am applying or the, the, your traffic is beyond the send rate. Um, the, probably the send rate uh, increases with the with, uh, reputation, but given I don't have a great reputation with this mailbox provider, is it a valid strategy to say, okay, I just send, send, send slowly? I have still a million of, of emails, but I send uh, just a thousand a day, or let's say 10,000, and have a better, better success rate? Or is it a oh, okay. Fiction? So, so when the, when a mailbox provider rate limits you or like a rate limits a sender, it is usually either to protect the sender or to protect them, protect somebody from something. Um, this can be because over time you've established a huge amount of complaint rate over time. So the ratio, like you know, sometimes you have a spike, but it doesn't affect you. But if you kind of accumulate them over time, it can really impact your reputation. We don't trust you anymore. And then they're like, you know what? We're going to rate limit you. The re One of the reasons they're doing this is to make you look at your list and say, okay, maybe this, you know, 30, 40% of the list is useless to me. I don't need to send to it. They're kind of rate limiting you at the point of where you should be sending at. Uh, sometimes more because they're trying to stop you from annoying people. Other times, the rate limitations can be put into place simply because you're on a block list and that's it. They're, they're just going to mm. block every single email and not let it in. Yeah. The rate limits are as annoying as they can be. They're very informative. If you see a rate limit, it's not that sending less necessarily is going to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so like you queue your emails and instead of taking three days to send them, you take five days to send them. The rate limit is kind of take a step back, look at your list and fix what you need to fix with your with your, your, yeah. with your list. Yeah, okay. it, it really is more of a, a signal instead of like a limitation. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're sending emails to like a very small provider and for some reason, I don't know, your company is Greek, you're sending to a Greek ISP and they cannot possibly accept all of your emails, but the chances of that are like very low. Most of the time, it's just a warning like, hey, you have something to fix, please fix it. And you're not going to have a rate limit. Yeah. People shouldn't have um, that as a problem. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, now, one means or one, one way to get better reputation, better, better success rates is um, 
getting uh, to trying some sort of whitelisting. And you did mention Beamy um, as a trust signal towards the user, but maybe also t towards the, the mailbox provider. There are yeah. others here in Germany. We have a trusted dialogue and CSA, senders, certified yeah. senders alliance, something. Alliance, yeah. Yeah. There also used to be return path, which is now validity.com. Um, there may be others. So wh whitelisting, does that make sense? Is it worth the money? Some are really expensive. Okay. Yeah, some are really expensive. Um, so here's the thing. Um, the the BIMI is part of um, one of the authentication protocols somebody can enact. It's still a little bit annoying because you do need to have like a registered logo in order to do this. Mm -hmm. It's the only kind of easy way for everyone to track if, you know, I can just start using PayPal logo, right? So it's a kind of way to track. But authentication is the first step to prove that your emails are yours and all the other ones are not. So, hey, look at the difference in my real emails and the fake emails. When it comes to certifications, um, a lot of times certain, bu uh, certain businesses need them because of the industry they are in. They're having a hard time with specific spam filters that are, are more strict, but not as grandiose, let's say, or the budget of you know Google uh, behind them. So sometimes it can be a little bit white and black and having this certified... Um, The certification can help. So uh, CSA definitely is, is one that can help you, especially in the European market, if you're having any issues. But what the certifications make you do in order to have them is make you a good sender. You have to follow the laws. Uh, no matter where you live, you have to have consent. You need to be sending um, emails that don't are not considered spam. And the definition of spam is an unsolicited or unwanted email. So even if I give you my consent, I can still f deem your email unwanted. Uh, so still spam. So these certifications make you just a good sender. Um, force you to have an unsubscribe link, force you to have your who is public, you know, so that you can take credit for your good and bad actions. Therefore, not only does the certification help with certification, but it also helps them because it kind of forces people to be better senders. Mm -hmm. So if you can just force yourself to be a better sender, you might not need a certification to land in the inbox. Unless you're like in a very difficult industry or, you know, certain industries have to email government officials and the government officials don't allow external emails. And there's all these like things you have to do in order for the emails that they need to receive to be received. Then, you know, going that route is is important. But if you have a regular business and you don't you don't need to have um, a certification because the certification is going to force you to be a good sender. You have to follow all the laws, even if you're an American company, you still have to follow GDPR, you need to protect consumers, send good emails um, from reputable sources that, you know, s um, protect data of your customers and things like that. You're going to be good. So it's like a... I have a middle <laughs> uh, opinion on the certifications. I yeah. don't think most people need them, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Okay. Just follow the rules. Best practices will always help. It's annoying, but it's true. Fair enough. Um, then there was another term. Uh, there was spam traps that came up multiple times in your talk. But yes. I guess uh, <laughs> people did not get what that means. Who is creating a spam trap? Why would they? And why would spam trap emails end up on my list? Ooh, okay. So um, a spam trap, the word trap is in it, is a way to um, find senders who are either not following best practices, such as either purchasing lists or not protecting their forms, uh, not having double opt-in or, you know, list validation tools when during sign-up, things like that. Um, a spam trap is simply an email that, an email address that can receive emails, but is not does not um, have a human behind it. So it's like a, a company that will either buy domains that used to exist buy and create inboxes that receive emails. And what they will do is that they will hide these emails all over the internet. And um, if you're scraping emails off LinkedIn or purchasing mm -hmm. lists or things like that, they will be there because the machine is unable to tell. You can pass them through a list cleaner and they will still pass as valid emails. 
unless somebody figured out they were there, but there's millions and millions of new ones created a day. Mm -hmm. Now, another type of spam trap is email addresses that used to exist and they're not used by that person anymore. So now imagine all those email addresses we created in high school that no one ever uses again. <laughs> uh, those mailbox providers, like, you know, I used to have a Hotmail back in the day and um, I never used it. And I tried to log in a couple and I, can, I cannot log in anymore. Uh, but if you send an email to it, it doesn't bounce actually. Which is very funny. As somebody, I was geeky enough. I tested it. Does my email still exist? Mm -hmm. And I cannot log into it, but it can still accept emails. So, for example, if I were to sign up with that email address everywhere, those people would continue emailing them, especially if they don't have double opt in and confirmation and things like that. Mm -hmm. And Hotmail would know that this email address hasn't been used in like more than a decade. Okay. It's easy for Hotmail to kind of um, realize that these people either haven't cleaned the list in a long time, which unfortunately happens, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I did sign up to stuff back in the day. So if anybody still has my email address and they're sending me emails, the inbox exists. It's able to accept emails, but I'm not in control of it anymore. So Hotmail can tell all the people that are in that inbox, hey, they haven't cleaned their list or they're buying lists. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of ways for them to end up in your list. And the one way, the best way to get rid of them is not even through list validation, it's through engagement. They will never engage or buy anything from you. There's no human there. Okay, yeah, we're always getting back to that. Uh, you did mention about <laughs> list cleaning. Um, Maybe in two different senses, one in a technical way, one, one in a like, like overhaul, ask for the opt-in once again or something. So listing, is that a, a term uh, that you can define or is it just multiple ways? Yes, definitely. So th there's two types. So there's the organic way based on the engagement to have people open, things like that. Uh, we want to remove them if they're not going to bring any value to our business. And there's list validation tools um, that do this technically by ensuring that the email is capable Doesn't of bother. receiving Yeah, 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 an okay. email. So as okay. a bounce. So they will let you know all, all those um, different, you know, is it risky or not? Yeah. And things like that. Okay. Um, moving on. Um, the email service provider. So the, the Amazon or Mailgun or whatever you use for yes. e delivering email out of Mordic. Uh, do they make a difference? Can, can it, are they... ESPs who have better chances of good good open rate or good good uh, delivery or inbox rates or is it all the same as long as you have a unique dedicated IP? Ah, okay. So, oof, this this all depends on the type of business you're running and the the volume and all, and of course the budget you have for it. But the reputation falls on both parties: the sending IPs, whoever's sending it for you, and the sender domain that is sending the email. Mm -hmm. So. Both of those together are going to help, of course, a company that allows people to spam through its, you know, infrastructure will affect your deliverability. But if you're with any reputable business that sends emails and, and has, you know, thousands and millions of emails being sent from it, um, there's no issue. Your reputation is your own and you can manage it. Yeah, it's not like, like you know, an entire IP network, etc. could be deemed bad or something. Okay. Yeah, and and even if, even if a, a whole IP, like for example, I had a customer that uh, was listed that that was sending from IPs that were listed, and they had an issue they couldn't migrate, but uh, their domain was fine. Their emails were inboxing a hundred percent, even though the IPs um, themselves, because it wasn't because of them that the issue happened, it was because of somebody else. The mailbox providers are getting they're really strong every day. Mm. Um, they're able to tell the difference between the sender being an issue and you know the infrastructure being an issue. Yeah, that's funny, isn't it? How 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 the do, the domain can be top rated and the IP can all be read and post multiple yeah, tools. Uh, exactly. Yeah, but they they at the same point they say that that that's just one of many many indicators. Exactly. And so don't worry. Yeah, the historical reputation is important. What you've done through time, or how people are, you know, mm -hmm. what people are doing with your emails and what you're doing with it as well. It's very. Um, Mm -hmm. it's so important and it sounds silly you know like it's you know, really it doesn't yeah, it does <laughs> a lot of green flags will help um, erase a big red one yeah 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 especially if, if the red one is something that is not entirely under your control exactly um, uh, next up from, from a colleague of mine uh, list unsubscribe um, for if you send newsletters you should have this header that that gives the button in, in a email client where you can unsubscribe from this newsletter. Uh, when many people click that 
button. I always think that's a good thing. Can can it be a red flag too or no? Um, no, that button is so uh, not uh, all like um, emailing systems will do this for you. Uh, some people don't even notice it really and they don't think that, think about it. So it's a really great question. So um, in many mailbox providers, uh, instead of clicking on the unsubscribe link inside the email, you have the the link inside the mailbox provider tool. So it makes it easier to unsubscribe. I, I'm on, I'm in the group of people that think it's great that it's there. It reduces the spam complaints. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. a one click way to unsubscribe from an email. Um, your ESP is going to get the information. So you're able to get the information and unsubscribe them. It won't get clicked by the spam filter because it's in the header. It's, you know, the, the, mm. the ESP is looking for it to add it there. And um, I know, I know it, that was, it, we always get disappointed when people unsubscribe, but it's okay. Just let them go. Um, mm. the, that a lot of people have had seen an actual um, lowering of their spam rates because when the button was kind of introduced because some people were just annoyed at specific types of emails. And I don't know, the company didn't have a very good preference center or way for the person to manage it. So by doing that, they were able to kind of like reverse engineer a preference center and it reduced spam rates. Uh, because people were able to unsubscribe correctly from the right place. Yeah, yeah. Well, the right place. In in your mind, what is the intention from the user? What is the right way to handle this list unsubscribe? Is it really unsubscribe from this list, or is it an entire do not contact? Ooh, I think that depends on the, the your capacity. You know, because a lot of times we have websites that have these beautiful preference senders, but at the end of the day, they just send the same email to everyone. Mm. So they have, they know what I want, but they can't, they don't, they cannot afford it. Mm. Um, I, I think it, it, it's more of a question of what is the goal behind your email? And if your goal behind your email is, you know, getting people to come to an event or get informed or buy something to unsubscribe them based on that preference. So the easiest example would be an airline. Maybe I looked for some ticket prices for Japan. You don't really have to remind me 20 times a week until I buy them. Can you leave mm. me alone? I want to unsubscribe from that. I don't want to necessarily unsubscribe from the plane tickets because I'm going to uh, to Inbox Expo this August, for example. I need those emails. Yeah. Um, so there, a separation would make sense. But if you, in your business side, you don't have this preference center, things like that, unsubscribe people and try to re-engage them differently. Okay. Okay. Um Uh, I, I do have some some more related questions. Maybe, maybe one more uh, general question, and that is uh, use of subdomains or sender addresses, etc. Yes. Um, is there any sort of favorite setup where you say, okay, the, the the email or newsletters should come from a different subdomain than transactional emails or whatever? Is there any sure. thing you recommend? You recommend? Yeah, um, I'm I'm on the side of if there's different types of emails, and by types I mean, like you said, transactional versus marketing versus you know like holiday emails, for example, and to divide it. Based on that, now don't go crazy, you know, uh, sign ups, one email, passwords, another email, but the important emails like the invoices, uh, reset passwords, um, confirmation emails, uh, bills, all those really, really, really important things, those should come from one subdomain, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the marketing, anything that's marketing, there to sell, get people to come to an event, those sh should be another subdomain. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the time to separate, you know, two types of emails in your week, I don't think you need multiple senders. But if you do have like your MailChimp and then you have your Shopify emails being sent from Shopify and your mailbox provider emails, it might be good to have a marketing, a transactional and your base domain as your inbox. Mm -hmm. um, but don't go crazy. It's just more to define like here to make it easier for a computer to define like these are the super important emails that even if the person reported the brand as spam, they should still get a reset email password, right? Mm -hmm. Those should come all together and anything that sells is something else. That way, if those don't have good deliverability, they don't impact your, your business for your current customers being able to use your tools or, you know, ask for refunds or do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was really thinking about the, the larger businesses. Um, yeah. And especially using their base domain for any sort of marketing emails. I'm always 
Uh, I have mixed feelings. <laughs> Fearful. It's stressful, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. then especially that uh, a lot of us don't have like DMARC implemented, let alone with all the d- subdomains and things like that. It's um, for big businesses. Both of those might be kind of interesting to, to take care of, you know, monitor your DMARC at the same time as your, you know, singular subdomain reputation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and getting DMARC activated for the main domain is, is a hard thing to do. While for a subdomain it's much easier. Yeah, it can, and it can be, um, and it's a it's a stressful process already to you know to DKIM and SVF can be stressful mm. uh, based on the size of your organization and you know um, especially businesses that are international between American stuff and I, European IPs and all of that. Mm. It can be very very stressful to manage all of this. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, when it comes to an aggressive policy, then you. You don't have friends anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. I know yeah, you're, yeah. you're really stressed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about uh, while we're getting to the end of the conversation. Uh, and one one of the th- topics of discussion is always bounce handling. What what is the the best bounce handling possible? Because right now. In Mordic, we go pretty straightforward. We go then do the necessary stuff, but we're not very sophisticated. And there are 10 or 20 ideas of what else should we do? How should we deal with soft bounces, etc.? When should we involve do not contact and when not? Blah, 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 blah. Do you have any, any scenario or any perfect bounce handling where you would think this is what you should look for? This is what you should act? Ah, okay. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> different mailbox providers are going to give different bounce messages, even though it's the same kind of bounce. So you have the mailbox full. The message that they give you is not necessarily a no, copy-paste no. between Google and Hotmail. So that's where the annoying c- can come in and where the differences come, where people are tracking specific words to group them together as the same type of bounce that will have the same type of output, like getting removing them from the, from the list or allowing them to soft bounce four times before being removed from a list. Exactly. So the the one thing that can be seen differently through ESPs, and sometimes people don't realize it, is the ESP, like CakeMail versus MailChimp, is going to decide what they do with specific messages. So if a mailbox is full, some of them will allow it four times and on the, then will unsubscribe. Some will allow it three times and the fourth time it happens, immediately unsubscribe it. So that's where different businesses might have different issues because, for example, uh, one bounce that is very interesting is uh, the spam house bounce. If your domain is listed on spam house, Microsoft mm. will bounce every single of your emails, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because of your domain. Yep. Uh, it would be very interesting to have ESPs stop sending those emails to Microsoft because we know preemptively that if we see that and it's still listed, it will bounce. We like we know in the future that this will happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, why even send out that email? So I'm using this example to, to show or to illustrate that based on the business you're in and the frequency at which you're emailing people and the frequency at which you can fix issues or monitor things, has to come into account into how you handle bounces. Because if you're really, really fast and you're sending, you know, uh, welcome emails, you know, you have a million signups a day. From a million signups, we can imagine that a good 10% minimum is Hotmail. So all those signups are bouncing. No one's getting those emails to confirm their accounts. What do we do? Mm. Um, we need a form that is able to react quickly and say, hey, please use another email because we have an issue or whatever message you want to say. Uh, bounces can and will always be handled differently by different businesses. Um, it's when you're doing things on your own, it's using a little bit of logic based on your volume, how people react, and how you send emails. Yeah. Th- then you can be more or less strict yeah. more, on things. I mean, it's, it's twofold. One thing is the things that the, the person has to decide who sets up the system and, and yeah. things like, okay, five times you're out is something you can easily do on, on the campaign side or whatever in, in, logic, yes. in logic. But the means that are provided, like... like uh, Reading the bounce, you mean? You can, yeah, you get the soft bounces from Amazon or, or you, have, yeah. you have groups of soft bounces and not everything is the same, etc. So, so like, like uh, technological means that are provided by Mordic, 
this is what we're currently discussing. What what else should we do? And um, yeah, it's an ongoing discussion. And, uh, yeah, no, it's an interesting one. Here. Yeah. Uh, bounces are super interesting. Huh. They can tell you the. F they You're can right. predict the future, <laughs> and uh, people are like, "Oh, less than one percent, I'm good." It's like, uh, "No, did you read the bounces? What type of bounces? I don't know. It was less than one percent." It's so important <laughs> to yeah. read the types that come in, yeah. and uh, it is a little bit annoying sometimes when um, if you don't have a list of those words that you can group together. Um, over time, you will accumulate them, mm. and you know different providers, and you'll know what the mailbox full is for Google, AWS, Hotmail and all the you know gmx and everyone mm. um but it's extremely important to read it like microsoft tells you hey we're starting to junk your emails even if you don't have sds and it's not your dedicated ips it's time to do something you don't wait until you're they're bouncing and they're being blocked completely it's too late you had the, like three months of hotmail telling you in your bounces hey we're junking hey we're junking mm -hmm. and you didn't even look at it yeah. um Bounces can tell you the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering whether that is something that, that Morty can do in the first place. I mean, what we normally do is is uh, have the the ESP send us a, a copy of of each soft bounce, so we can do this this grouping and, and looking person looking at it. But the the ESP may not even provide an API to get the soft soft bounce content to to. Oh, the I know. Morty system. <laughs> I know, but if if your if your business is in the like understands what we're talking about and can do something like this, mm. it's maybe time to go towards a business that gives you this kind of information, mm -hmm. you know, or looking into using a, an MTA uh, and building your own infrastructure around mm. it. Because if if you can do it, like mm. come on, <laughs> like, okay. um, like with Motic. Right? Can you imagine if you can, um, if you were able to grab all these bounces, the the kind of insights you can give people, yeah. the things you can put in a graph, and the things you can monitor, is um, crazy. Way more interesting than open and click rates. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> open rates is the thing by itself. Oh, so many more questions, but I have to come to an end here. Um, Thank you very much for those insights. Is, are, are there any pointers you want to give to people, good websites to learn from or talks to watch and so on? Oh, of course. I um, I definitely have a, a link, uh, yt.academy slash resources. Mm -hmm. I have a list of all the um, my favorite places to learn or people that I, I learn from that I stalk on Twitter and LinkedIn and I read their articles and things like that. So if there's anything there, uh, definitely interesting place uh, to learn from. And um, if not, uh, we have uh, email console, we have a, a major announcement where we finally partnered up with uh, Radek from Bouncer and um, we have his tool is going to be um, using our tool inside of it in order to promote uh, deliverability monitoring tools, which is great. So we're working together, honestly, to democratize deliverability and simplify it <laughs> for people uh, by making it accessible. And of course, you know, with deliverability, the whole point is to make sure that people actually get the email. So we want to ensure that you can stay connected, you know, with your subscribers uh, via email. Because mm -hmm. um, all the marketing in the world is not going to save you if no one gets it, right? Okay. So this... This this news is something people can find on your website already. Yes, they can find it on our website, on the uh, Bouncer website uh, mm -hmm. as well. They can even try the uh, beta testing. Oh. Um, you have some free credits there to to play around and see how you can monitor your IPs and domains uh, against the uh, block lists, okay. and of course uh, a seed listing tool to yeah, test you know, your inbox placement. The link, uh, added in the show notes, and, and uh, everybody should try it out right now. Of course, definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, for for those in the audience who do not consider uh, Bounce as the greatest fun on the earth, <laughs> I guess you're <laughs> there to to help them get better business success with better email inbox rates. How can people get best in touch with you? directly uh the best way is to connect with me through linkedin um or to schedule an appointment directly uh mm. with me i love to geek out about email so even if you just want to talk and uh, get excited about email uh, be my guest um but if you need any any help with your deliverability or um understanding where to get better resources that's also fine by me uh just connect and ask away okay very cool 
thank you so much. This was a ton of nerd stuff, I'm afraid. I, I, I <laughs> some people, people are still awake, but uh, I, I know that many people are very, very keen to, to learn the best and, and, and learn the details and get help, etc. So uh, everybody stay in touch, uh, give us a feedback on the Modicast and uh, of course get in touch with Jana Tori as well. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope we talk soon once again, maybe some, some even more Modic related things and uh, next news, ne next announcements from, from either side. Thank you so much. Uh, take care. See you soon. Of course, thank you. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah, I gotta say that the whole trend of having to produce engagement kind of has two sides. And I think the bad side is that um, all these informative newsletters without a lot of links or reasons to answer that newsletter will just go go down and get into spam a lot. Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, as you said, it's it's. Uh It's not a black and white thing. No, uh, it it feels to me a little bit like the early days in SEO and and, and so on in advertising mm -hmm. uh, that that things that you do artificially will always fire back on you. So yeah, yeah. it's it's one of so many parameters. So, so I wouldn't lose my head about it. <laughs> <laughs> We have another community spotlight, and this is about uh, Volya Pivovatchuk. Uh, I hope that's not yeah. too too badly butchered. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, she is from Slovenia, and mm -hmm. um, she's been pretty active these days in in really quality modic content. I know that you learned from that as well. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, she's also coding, by the way. I guess, yeah. or at least contributing to to GitHub. Yeah, I was uh, able to test one of her PRs and see the quality of her work. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, so so have a look there. Yeah, talking about community, um, Roof compiled the second quarter Modic Community Roundup. And um, I mean, there's a lot of things you might have already heard, which we brought up in the Modic cast, but it's a so. <laughs> very nice and just compiled quality list of what happened in the second quarter. And we will link to that in the show notes. And talking about community, I think we might have a date or being very close to having a date for you know? the Sao oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean for Sao Paulo. Oh okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. It's um it's a secret, so but don't tell everybody. But we're ninety nine percent safe yeah. um on November third and fourth. Mm -hmm. Um that's a Thursday and a Friday. The second is a public holiday in Brazil. Or at least in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the day. So it's going to be two days where day one is probably going to be all the talks. And, and day two will be a lot of learning and hands-on opportunities for, nice, yeah. for people on the ground. So, yeah, if you're a potential attendee, save the date. Surely. Yeah. Well, that's it for today, yeah, I guess. I think so, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Give us all your feedback. We appreciate it a lot, especially we need more uh, housekeeping for the next time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's always fun. Um, yeah, other than that, yeah, stay stay active in the Amorti community. Enjoy your 4.4.1. We did not yet install any <laughs> of it, <laughs> but we will do today. Surely. Um, yeah, so stay safe. Enjoy the summer uh, or wherever you are. I mean, maybe you are in the south. <laughs> enjoy the winter. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Take care. See you. See, uh, talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.